understanding a rare and deadly tornado. They certainly have reported damage greater than EF3, which would allow for wind speeds up to 165 miles per hour. How climate change is affecting individual parts of the UK. The warming that we have observed is greater for central and eastern England, so Northamptonshire, Bedfordshire. It's Friday the 17th of December and you're listening to Weathersnap from the Met Office. Hello, I'm Claire Nazir and this is Weathersnap, an insider's guide to the week's weather headlines. As darkness fell on the Mississippi Valley last Friday, a deadly tornado ripped across four states of the US, an extremely rare event with tragic repercussions. Deputy Chief Forecaster Nick Silkstone explains how it became so powerful. It actually began several days previously with a sort of a, a mid-latitude storm actually that was actually named I believe by the Weather Channel due to some snow it was producing across Utah and some other northern states but the main problems for, for this event were the warm sector that it drew up from the Gulf of Mexico which meant for the time of year you know December is not a month we usually um, associate with tornadoes we had a very broad warm and humid warm sector that came across some central states and unfortunately, there was just enough instability within there with the, um, I would say, like the, I don't know, the dynamics or the, the wind speeds and how they change with height to support rotating storms, supercells, and also um, tornadoes that they generated. So what you're saying was a real battle between the warm, moist air loaded with energy and that clash with much colder air aloft. Is that correct? Is that quite a classic sort of setup? This tornado or family of tornadoes, it's yet to be confirmed if it was one or multiple ones along the same family, the surveys continue. They believe that the path may have stretched around 250 miles from southwest to northeast, which is an exceptional length. And that requires basically a surface cyclone that translates northeastwards while at the same time as deepening. So when you get your your sort of like, you know, more stereotypical um, outbreaks in the the Great Plains, Oklahoma and Texas, you tend to there have a surface cyclone that just deepens, but it's not overly mobile. So in this case, the the movement of the cyclone, the broad warm sector meant that it was able to maintain almost perfect conditions for over four hours in duration. What states were mostly affected by this? So it ran across uh, Arkansas, uh, Missouri, Tennessee, and unfortunately Kentucky, where the majority of fatalities and missing people have been reported. Because it moved across four states, it has led to this being dubbed um, the Quad State Tornado after the the previous um, longest path, or or the current, should I say, longest path, which was the Tri-State Tornado, which was only 219 miles in length, which dates back to March 1925. And obviously, therefore, the, we, un, we don't know yet what level of tornado it was on the enhanced Fujita scale. There certainly have been surveys so far that reported damage greater than uh, EF3, which would allow for uh, wind speeds up to 165 miles per hour. But they have allowed until all, all surveys are complete, you know, a ceiling for that to go up. And be higher and you know it's a very anecdotal but you see some of the pictures of the damage and you can certainly see that that is comparable in some ways to um you know higher ef rated tornadoes that we have seen you know in past decades deputy chief forecaster nick silkstone each day weather observations are taken across the uk which can be compared to data taken over the past 30 years doing this allows us to understand how climate is changing To find out what this means for localised temperatures across the UK, climate correspondent Graham Madge spoke to Met Office Head of Climate Statistics, Dr Mark McCarthy. We tend to measure climate against 30-year averaging periods. So these are known as climate normal periods. And that's what we want to use as the benchmark against which observational records of weather and climate can be compared to put them into context, really, for for that location. What are we seeing in these 30-year climate average periods. Is this man-made climate change? Well, what is really important for us in order to monitor our climate and our changing climate and to monitor what we need to be adapted to or what situations we might be vulnerable to is to, to monitor changes that may occur for whatever cause. And we 
know that climate is changing due to the emissions of greenhouse gases by human activity. Um, so what we're seeing is that the, our climate is warmer. Rainfall has increased by just over 7% on average for the UK, uh, but also sunshine has increased by 5.6%. There's a wealth of detail in the climate records over the last 60 years, including a lot of regional variation. Um, so the warming that we have observed is greater uh, for parts of central and eastern England. So particularly looking at areas around Northamptonshire, Bedfordshire, where actually the warming in some locations has been greater than one degree. Uh, and the warming rates are slightly lower further north over Scotland, so closer to sort of 0.7 degrees. So that uh, uh, distinction between those parts of the country that are perhaps uh, geographically a bit closer to continental Europe and those that are more exposed to the North Atlantic. So that's one aspect. But we also see variations in changes in rainfall. The greatest increases in rainfall uh, are across uh, large parts of Scotland and some of the upland areas in the UK, uh, where increases in rainfall by greater than 10% have been observed, uh, while sort of sunshine sees something of an east-west split. So some of the greatest increases in sunshine have, uh, occurred in the on the eastern side of the country. So the rate of change that we've seen in the climate record for the UK since 1961, is that greater than at any other period, say, over the last century or so? Certainly for some aspects of what we're seeing are very notable. So uh, the warming of uh, just under a degree is a very significant change and the 21st century that we find ourselves in now is uh, warmer than any sort of comparable period in the past. So that's very notable and significant looking back at our, our climate records going 100 years or more in the past. Uh, other variables such as uh, rainfall and sunshine, we can see some variations in that even on a 30 year average. Uh, but even there, the changes that we're observing in our climate and looking at the in the context of the wider evidence base we have, there's a very strong signal of the fact that we are influencing elements of our climate beyond just the temperature. Now with a roundup of the conditions across the UK for the next few days, Alex Deacon. High pressure is dominating the weather this weekend and probably beyond. It's moving in at the moment and it is going to stick around. High pressure brings dry weather and light winds and this one is also likely to bring quite a lot of cloud and increasingly the likelihood of some thick fog patches. So foggy mornings on Saturday and Sunday but that fog is going to be hard to shift. At this time of year it often sticks around all day and that is likely to be the case particularly over parts of eastern England. Now the exact position of the high will dictate where we see the most stubborn fog and also where we see any breaks in the cloud. We are likely to see some sunshine, western parts of Wales, but also northern Scotland doing okay for sunny spells through this weekend. It's going to turn a bit colder over the next few days after a mild spell to start this week. Temperatures by the weekend back closer to or even a touch below average, probably peaking in single figures for most. And where it stays foggy, temperatures will be in low single figures. However, this weekend, also likely to see the highest temperatures on the tops of the Scottish mountains. The high pressure moving in is creating something called a temperature inversion. Temperatures down low will be low, but as the mountains poke above that temperature inversion, well, we could see temperatures maybe even into the teens over the Scottish Highlands and the Grampians. So that's something to look out for this weekend, the highest temperatures over the mountains of Scotland. How does it look as we go into the Christmas week? Well, too early to say exactly with the details for that at this stage. So the message at the moment is stay tuned and the Met Office will give you the best forecast in the run up to Christmas. Thanks, Alex. Just before we go, here's Martin Bowles with last week's highs and lows. Here are the UK weather extremes for the week beginning 6th of December. I'll start with the coldest place as that was at the very beginning of the week. Temperatures dropped to minus 6.6 .6 degrees Celsius at Braemar in the Cairngorms early on Monday morning. Much milder weather moved into the UK at the end of the week. The highest recorded temperature 
was 14.7 Celsius at Harden in northeast Wales on Sunday. The largest daily rainfall was 52.0 mm at Thistinham in Powys, mid Wales on Wednesday. The sunniest place was RAF Odium in Hampshire. 6.4 hours was recorded on Friday. The highest officially recorded wind gust was 92 miles an hour on the island of North Uist on Sunday evening as a deep depression across northern Scotland triggered what is known in meteorological circles as a sting jet. Thanks, Martin. That's it for Weather Snap. I'm Claire Nazir. Editor is Adrian Holloway. Weather Snap is a podcast by the UK Met Office. For the latest weather conditions where you are, download the Met Office weather app.